This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Sign up for the Holiday Nebula Bundle Deal for just $11.79 a year at curiositystream.com forward slash real engineering to get ad free access to our new podcast Modulus. If I was to ask you today, what technology breakthrough the world needed most, what would you say? This needs to be a technology we could realistically develop in the next 10 years. So none of that sci-fi nonsense. This is something I think about a lot. Nuclear fusion or cheaper, safer and cleaner fission energy are good candidates. Human society would be transformed by economic fusion power. But fusion is certainly not a technology that we can commercialize in the next 10 years. Many people are working on safer and cheaper nuclear fission, but that too has many hurdles to overcome. I think about how the world would change if carbon nanotubes somehow became a viable material. A new stronger and lighter material of carbon nanotubes caliber wouldn't open doors to new design possibilities, it would open portals to new dimensions. But that again is not going to happen anytime soon. No, if I was to pick one technology that would have the biggest impact on our society today, that is within grasp, it would be cheap, scalable energy storage for the grid. The electricity grid works nearly entirely on a just-in-time manufacturing method. We generate the electricity just as it's needed. There is no warehouse of electricity that we can dip into. Pumped hydroelectricity does provide some storage and is a nearly centuries-old technology, but it's not scalable to our current needs. Lithium-ion batteries are our best option right now. They have proven their worth in the Hornsdale Power Reserve in Australia. It was commissioned primarily as a fast frequency response service. This means it can act as both a load when the frequency of the grid gets too high, or as a power source when the frequency of the grid gets too low. Kind of how a flywheel maintains the rotational speed of an engine. You see, our grids are designed to operate on a particular alternating current frequency. If the grid deviates from that frequency, it can cause all kinds of issues that generally just result in protective measures being activated to protect the infrastructure and ultimately cuts power to its users. A blackout. South Australia was struggling with these blackouts. In 2016, tornadoes ripped through South Australia and damaged some power lines. This caused the voltage and frequency of the grid to deviate from its baseline. This caused the wind turbines to trip their protective measures and lower output. Now this was a massive problem because this is what South Australia's power generation looked like on that day with nearly 50% of their power coming from wind. To deal with the sudden decrease in output in wind, the interconnector to Victoria attempted to increase its power transfer, but rather quickly shut itself down to prevent the line frying itself. The grid basically did the technological equivalent of a human passing out when they see a drop of blood. A chain reaction of panic, leaving 850,000 people without power. In response, the Australian energy regulator is trying to sue the wind companies it had approved for not doing a job they were not capable of doing in frequency regulation. I feel like they only have themselves to blame. South Australia had built far more wind power than its grid could reliably handle. It lacked the necessary interconnections to neighboring grids and energy storage facilities like pumped hydro, batteries, or simply reserve power natural gas plants. It was a poorly planned grid instability was inevitable. We are thankfully learning from these mistakes, but as renewables grow, the challenge of preventing blackouts like this is only going to grow. We won't just need fast frequency response, but we will also need load shifting, where we have enough storage to charge batteries when renewables are available and discharge them when it isn't. This is going to be expensive. Lithium ion batteries are the cheapest we have right now, but when it comes down to it, they weren't designed for this job. They are designed to be light and energy dense for portable electronics. But for a stationary battery, that's a pretty useless trait to have. It's like having an underwater hairdryer. Just doesn't make sense. Lithium ion batteries are the cheapest form of energy storage available because their mass market adoption has allowed for the economies of scale to reduce their price. But what if we designed a new type of battery? A battery that was designed from the ground up specifically for the grid. To learn more about this, I spoke with Donald Sadaway, a renowned professor of materials chemistry at MIT and founder of liquid metal battery company Ambry. The, the last thing I do is seek the advice of the incumbents. 
The incumbents are threatened by, by in, uh, radical innovation. You realize that the lithium ion battery did not come from the battery industry. The battery industry refused to even manufacture the lithium ion battery. So Sony, Sony wanted a better battery to power their handheld device. And this is 1990. And Sony goes to all of the big battery producers in Japan. And they go and they say, here's the, here's the formulation, build it. And here's a purchase order for pick a number, some tens of millions of dollars. And each and every uh, Japanese battery manufacturer said, no, I'm not building it. We have all of this capital investment in the manufacture of nickel metal hydride batteries. We can't build this battery in that plant. And so they said no. But somebody at some point said, you know, if we want to have lithium ion batteries for our appliances, there's only one way we're going to have them. We're going to build them ourselves. And Sony says, we're not a battery company. It says, we need batteries and there's only one way we're going to get them. We're going to build them ourselves. And so Sony built the first lithium ion battery manufacturing facility. And very soon thereafter, they were getting inquiries from people who were building mobile phones saying, can we have those? And then people who are building uh, mobile computers, laptop computers, can we have those? And by 1995, nickel metal hydride was pretty much uh, displaced. So what battery chemistry is Professor Sadoway trying to build and can it have the same revolutionizing disruptive effect on grid storage that lithium ion batteries had for consumer electronics? The idea started simply. Professor Satterway had decades of experience in electrolysis for the refinement of metals like iron and aluminium. That process takes a lot of energy to refine the metal. So why not try to make that process reversible and allow the reverse reaction to give electricity back? This is the basic concept of liquid metal batteries. We alloy and de-alloy metals in a perfectly reversible reaction. They don't need to be light, they need to be cheap, and as Professor Sadoway says, I say if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt. So how do we go about choosing materials for a battery like this? What does the design ideation phase look like? Professor Sadoway is a professor of materials chemistry at MIT. Looking at a periodic table is a different experience for him. This is what he sees when picking materials for a technology like this. For the liquid metal battery, we first need to refine our search down to metals and metalloids, which are these elements. Next, we need to maximize the difference in electronegativity to maximize our voltage. In general, electronegativity is highest on the top right of the periodic table and lowest on the lower left. So, our electrode materials can be further narrowed down to elements in these two groups. Next, as Professor Sadoway said, if we want our battery to be dirt cheap, we have to make it out of dirt. So let's plot our relative abundance of elements. Of the candidate elements for our negative electrode, calcium is by far the most common, which is the negative electrode of the ambery liquid metal battery. However, they didn't arrive at their current electrode materials just by analyzing the periodic table. Experimentation was vital as this is a complex and dynamic system. They have tested several combinations of different electrode materials from these two groups, and there are a lot of complicated interactions to consider. Ambry has landed on a calcium antimony cell chemistry. So how does it work? These materials are placed into a ceramic insulated cell together. When a current is applied, the materials begin to heat up and eventually they will turn to liquid and the metals will separate naturally as a result of their density differences. The heavier positive electrode sinks to the bottom with a neutral density electrolyte separating the lower density negative electrode on top. This makes building the cell very simple. Lithium ion batteries use complicated coding processes to build their electrodes. This is the charged state. Now, when a load is applied, the opposite electric current is experienced. This causes the calcium electrode to break into a calcium cation and two electrons. The cation travels across the electrolyte bridge and combines with the antimony and the electrons that have traveled on the external circuit to form a new alloy. This continues to happen until the calcium electrode is completely consumed. Now we just have the new mixed alloy and the electrolyte. This is the discharge state. 
To get back to the charge state, we simply apply the opposite current and the reverse reaction occurs and creates a fresh battery. Now this brings another advantage. Lithium ion batteries degrade over time. As they are charged and discharged, chemical reactions occur that damage the electrodes and reduce their ability to hold a charge. And many of the ways we need load shifting batteries to operate are the exact ways that accelerate this degradation over time. Taking a lithium ion battery from full to zero charge is particularly damaging. As few as 500 deep cycles can reduce the capacity of the NCA batteries that Tesla uses by as much as 20%. That represents about a year and four months of daily use for our load shifting batteries, whose job will be a daily one. However, LFP batteries, which Tesla has started using in its Chinese Model 3s, degrade much slower, even under deep cycling. And they have stated that they will use LFP batteries for stationary storage in the future. Depending on the temperature they operate at, LFP batteries drop to 85 to 95% capacity after 3000 cycles, higher temperatures result in higher capacity drop. However, Ambry have shown that their capacity fade is minimal even after 5000 cycles, thanks to the continual creation and destruction of its electrodes, allowing us to fully discharge our batteries on a daily basis for upwards of 20 years. However, as I'm sure you have been wondering, keeping the calcium and antimony electrodes so hot that they melt comes with disadvantages. For one, we are going to lose some of our electricity to heating the materials up to operational temperature. This reduces our round trip efficiency. So to, to explain it, if you put 100 units of electricity in, th there are some losses because there's some joule heating and so on and so forth. With liquid metal battery, it's um, about 80% because the, the, the difference, the 20%, is the energy loss desirably to heat the battery to keep it at temperature. So you say, wow, 80%, that's 20% loss. What's up with that? The round trip efficiency of pumped hydro is 70%. So we're better than pumped hydro. But the, the thing is that this is a, a case of uh, don't, uh, don't answer irrelevant questions because the, the key question is, what is the, the cost of electricity? So this is where things get a little complicated. Luckily, we have an equation to calculate the levelized cost of electricity storage. It's determined by the total costs, which are the sum of the initial capital costs, the continual operation and maintenance cost, the cost of charging, and the end of life costs, divided by the total electricity discharged. Based on Ambry's calcium antimony cell chemistry, the cost of electrode materials vastly undercuts current generation lithium ion batteries, with the total cost of the liquid metal battery electrode materials coming in at $17 per kilowatt hour versus $51.2 per kilowatt hour for the most common nickel manganese cobalt batteries. If they manage to get the initial capital cost down 66%, that decrease in round trip efficiency is a minor concern. These continual costs are hard to predict. Operations and maintenance costs for lithium ion batteries could include buying more batteries to bring total capacity back in line as the batteries fade. We also have very little data for end of life costs, which will primarily be determined by how easily disposed of or recyclable the batteries are. For both of these metrics, liquid metal batteries will likely have an advantage. However, even with the promise of liquid metal batteries, lithium ion batteries have a major leg up on any potential competitor. They have had decades to work on the manufacturing process and reduce their price, and they are still getting cheaper. Ambry have proven the cell chemistry works on the bench scale, but actually bringing a product to market is much harder than proving the science works. It's, it's simply the, the, the long journey from lab bench to, uh, to marketplace. We, you know, uh, here at MIT, I with uh, my, my team of students and postdocs, we worked on this. I had a concept and, and then we, we reduced it to practice and then got it to the point where we said, it's time to start a company. Now, how do you take that and turn it into a marketable product that is 
uh, able to be manufactured. You know, at the university, you know, you, you make five cells and one of them works and, and you get a publication out of it and everybody's high-fiving and so on. But, but in manufacturing, you have to have, everything has to work. So, so we had to design the manufacturing process. And there's nobody to turn to. There's no, there's no model. I can take the most brilliant, the most competent people in the lithium ion battery sector. And almost everything that they know is inapplicable because the lithium ion chemistry is different, which means that the format of the battery is different. Their needs are different. I mean, they have to guard against thermal rise. We have to guard against thermal fall. We want to keep our batteries hot. They're trying to prevent their batteries from getting hot. There are dielectric hermetic seals that have to survive 500, 600 Celsius. So obviously they're going to have to be ceramics, but ceramics are brittle, fragile, and they don't like thermal excursions. But we have to be able to, to uh, endure thermal excursions. And I can give you a ceramic. It can do it like that, but it's going to cost uh, something around a NASA price point. Designing an entirely novel product is not easy. Those dielectric hermetic seals in particular are a tricky bit of engineering. They need to be dielectric to separate the positive and negative electrodes. They need to form a seal to prevent gases and moisture from entering the battery and causing corrosion and secondary reactions. It needs to be corrosive resistant as those molten salt electrolytes can corrode many materials and to boot it needs to be heat resistant since the battery operates at 500 degrees Celsius. Those are four very specific combinations of material properties that don't come with an off-the-shelf rubber o-ring. It's one thing to design a prototype that works, but it's an entirely different beast to design a product that can be manufactured cost-effectively and reliably. When lithium-ion batteries first came to market in the 90s, their price per kilowatt hour was upwards of $3,000. But over the past three decades, that price has continually dropped to about $150 per kilowatt hour. There is no scenario where Ambry comes out of the gates at this price point. No matter how cheap their electrode materials are, the price of a novel manufacturing method will offset any cost savings until the economies of scale take over. This difficulty of bringing a new technology to market, despite the obvious potential advantages, is called technological lock-in. And it makes it incredibly difficult for newcomers to enter the market. If they can't compete with the cost straight out of the gate, they are going to struggle to find buyers. In order for new products like this to get to market and start their journey to affordability, they often need to find a niche market where their advantages outweigh their cost. So, where could liquid metal batteries find this niche market? As we explained, lithium ion batteries are temperature sensitive. Without proper thermal management, lithium ion batteries will, at best, degrade faster. But they can also malfunction or even catch fire. This has already happened with a large scale lithium ion battery in Arizona, where battery degradation led to a thermal runaway. In other words, a rack of batteries failed and caught fire, leading to the shutdown of every battery storage facility in the state until the cause of the problem was found. These disadvantages of lithium ion batteries are exactly what is going to open the door for liquid metal batteries. The liquid metal battery can work just fine in extreme conditions. After all, the entire product is designed to operate at 500 degrees. No cold or warm environment is going to interfere with its operation, making the battery better suited for hot weather climates. In an application where the batteries need to operate in a warm climate while being used daily and under deep cycling, liquid metal batteries may be able to justify their initial high price point for the right early adopter. And that's exactly what has happened. TerraScale is a data center company that is building a scalable data center that will operate on its own renewable microgrid in the warm desert climate of Reno, Nevada. It has already built 23 megawatts of geothermal and 10 megawatts of solar 
as part of their Phase 1 20 MW data center. This will be attractive to companies wanting to use green energy to run their servers, and companies that want to shield their data from potential power outages or even cyber attacks through grid vulnerabilities, which have become increasingly common over the last decade. This microgrid will shield TerraScale's customers' data from such vulnerabilities, but to run on renewables reliably, they are going to need a lot of energy storage, and for that, they have turned to Ambry, announcing very recently that they will partner with them for a massive 250 megawatt hour battery that will begin construction in 2021. Enough storage to run that 20 megawatt data center for 12 and a half hours straight. This will be an excellent test of the technology, and I for one will be following it closely, because if it succeeds, it's going to revolutionize how our grids operate, forming that missing link of renewables. We spoke with Professor Sadoway in far greater detail about his work with liquid metal batteries, but it's difficult to squeeze all that detail into a YouTube video. That's why we started Modulus, a podcast hosted by me and Stephanie from Real Science, a podcast where we will dive into the people behind the scientific stories we tell here on YouTube. We will talk to the scientists who are on the cutting edge of research, and by the people who are affected by the topics we discuss. We learn what it's like watching your life's work descend onto the Martian surface with Bobak Ferdowsi. We get inside information with people like Professor Sadoway pioneering revolutionary technology. This podcast will show the real life people behind these topics and the real life impact these scientific stories have on the world. The first episode of Modulus launched on Nebula today, the streaming platform made by me and several other educational YouTube content creators. It's the place to watch our videos and podcasts ad-free, along with original content that is not available anywhere else like my Logistics of D-Day series or Tom Scott's game show, Money. We can take more risks on Nebula, where we don't have to worry about the YouTube algorithm. There is so much original content there, with more being added all the time. And to make it even better, Nebula has partnered with CuriosityStream, the streaming platform with thousands of high-budget, high-quality documentaries, like this one called The Secret World of Lego, that gives an inside look into the world of Lego's headquarters in Denmark. If you've hesitated before to get CuriosityStream and Nebula, and never quite pulled the trigger, now is definitely the time to do it. For a limited time, a yearly subscription to the bundle deal is on sale for just $11.79 per year. That's less than a dollar per month. Signing up is also the best way to support this channel and all of your favorite educational content creators. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon are below.